đang ở trong một cái cuộc hành trình. Cuộc hành trình này kéo dài cho đến khi chúng ta gặp Chúa ở tại nơi thiên quốc. Cuộc hành trình này biến đổi chúng ta càng ngày càng trở nên giống Đức Chúa Giêsu Christ để chúng ta yêu mến Đức Chúa Cha với hết tấm lòng, trí khôn, sức lực, linh hồn của chúng ta để chúng ta yêu thương những người khác như Chúa đã yêu chúng ta. I call this the journey of love to become more like Jesus Christ. We are to we are on the journey of being spiritual mature in Christ. Do you remember what this journey starts with? It starts with knowledge, knowledge through the word of God and through experience. We see in the universe, we know that there is God. Through our conscience, through our mind, and through our experience, we know that there is God, and we know how He is. We know clearly about God through His Word. We have knowledge through the Word of God. The Word of God, the Bible, has two parts: is the Word of God, the Bible that we have in our hands, and then the Word of God is the person of Jesus Christ. The Word became flesh amongst us and dwelt amongst us, and so it starts with knowledge to know God. And from knowledge of God, we place our faith in Him, we trust in His love, and we trust in the blood of Jesus Christ. In Romans three twenty-five, we place our trust in the Lord. We Believe in the what he has taught us, and we place our hope in him. And from there, it touches our life, and it transforms us, our character. And we also have studied through some um, through some messages that the Lord transforms us, and we are people who love what God loves and hate what God hates. And the faith in the Lord it touches our will. And it not that we seek our own will, but we seek the will of God. We do not seek what pleases our eyes, what is beautiful to our eyes, such as Eve, but we seek that which pleases the Lord. And we have new desires. We desire what God desires. And today we study about new emotions. We have emotions like the Lord Jesus Christ. We have talked about two emotions. Feelings and emotions are very similar to one another. We talk about two feelings, and that is to love and to hate what God loves and hates. <coughs> and now we talk about emotions. Those who are mature in Christ, we will have the emotions as Jesus Christ. There are some religion that they want to take away all emotions of mankind, so that to the point where mankind has nothing, that you have emotionless. There's no love, no hate, no anger, no nothing, and you will be just like a rock, or like a robot, or a machine. And I met a young, a teenager, and he went to a boot camp, and in that boot camp. They tell you to suppress your emotions. Do not reveal it. But you know what? Emotions are what God gives to us to be happy, to be sad, to be angry. All those things are good. It is in the right place of it. Emotions, our emotions, God gives to us, and we praise the Lord and thank Him that we are people that have emotions. We are not a machine. We are not a. Creation that has no emotions. We are people who have emotions because we were created in the image of God. If we are sad, then we are at we naturally cry. If we're happy, we naturally smile. We do not be ashamed of that. And we see Jesus Christ. He also has emotions. In John eleven, records about an event. That is the event of Lazarus and his death. He was a close friend of Jesus Christ. Lazarus became ill, and someone came to Jesus and said, "Your friend, Lord, is ill." And Jesus stayed at Bethany, 
he continued to stay in Judea and did not go to Bethany. And so the disciples asked, Why is that, Lord? And Jesus said um, to them that Lazarus has died. And, and Jesus rejoiced because that has happened. Let's look at John 11, 14 to 44. <coughs> then Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus had died. And for your sake, I am glad that I was not there, so that you may believe. But let us go to him. I am glad, I am glad that I was not there. So Thomas, called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, Let us also go, that we may die with him. Now when Jesus came, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles off. And many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them concerning their brother. So when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him, but Mary remained seated in the house. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now, I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, Your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is coming into the world. When she had said this, she went and called her sister Mary, saying in private, The teacher is here, and he is calling for you. And when she heard it, she rose quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet come into the village, but was still in the place where Martha had met him. When the Jews were there, who were with her in the house, consoling her, saw Mary rise quickly and go out, they followed her, supposing that she was going to the tomb to weep there. Now when Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled. And he asked, and he said, Where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. So the Jews said, See how he loved him? But some of them said, Could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man also have kept this man from dying? Then Jesus, deeply moved again, came to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone lay against it. Jesus said, Take away the stone, Martha. The sister of the dead man said to him, Lord, by this time there will be an odor, for he has been dead four days. Jesus said to her, Did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone, and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I say this on account of the people standing around, that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out! The man who had died came out, his hands and feet bound with linen strips, and his face wrapped with a cloth. Jesus said to them, Unbind him and let him go. Our Heavenly Father, we pray that you will be with us at this time. Teach us, Lord, through your Spirit, who is the Spirit of Truth, the Spirit of Truth. Help us, Lord, to understand your Word. And rule through this time so that my, my words and our meditations, Lord, will be pleasing to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <coughs> this passage repeats one word often, an, an act, an, an action, a verb, that is, believe. Jesus did this so that people would believe that He is the one that sent from God, from heaven. And Jesus rejoiced and was glad because this was an opportunity for His disciples to uh, see His power, to see the resurrection power, to save one who has been dead, 
so that they believe that Jesus is from God. And this morning, we will not study about faith, but we will study about the emotions that Jesus had. First of all, we see that Jesus has joy. In verse 14 and 15, this is what is recorded. Lazarus has died, and for your sake I am glad that I was not there so that you may believe. I am glad that I was not there. Jesus had an emotion. He rejoiced. He was glad that his friend died. But he was not sad. But he was glad. This was an opportunity for Jesus to review his power so that all will believe that Jesus is the one that the Father sent. Jesus is a man. And so he had emotions, he had joy, gladness. But you know, Jesus is also God, and God also knows. God also has joy. In Zephaniah 3.17, The Lord your God dwells amongst you. You will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you by his love. He will exult over you with loud singing. Jehovah God, our Lord, sings, he rejoices with gladness. He is, Jesus is God, and he rejoices dwelling amongst his people, and he uses his people to save us and helps us. Harrietta Mears, according to Harrietta Mears, Sephaniah is the book that starts with sadness. It is a grieving book, but it ends with singing and songs. The beginning of Zephaniah, the book of Zephaniah, talks about sad events, but in the end is a song, a love song that is beautiful in the Old Testament. And here it says, I will sing with gladness and exult over you with loud singing. So our Lord is full of joy. Because we are created in the image of God, we also have the emotions and we have the joy of the Lord in us. And our joy is not re, is not based on our situation, our circumstances, but our joy is deep in the joy of the Lord. We see that there are people who are recorded in the Bible that have joy, such as Joseph. Joseph had a joy in the Lord when he saw his brothers and the brothers come from Egypt. And in Matthew 5, 25, verse 21, Matthew 25, 20, 21, Jesus speaks about the joy that we have with him in eternity. Jesus said that whoever is faithful to him, whoever uses the talents that God gives, faithful to the work of the Lord and brings benefits to his kingdom, Jesus said in Matthew 25, 21, enter into the joy of your master. Our joy comes from knowing the Lord, and in eternity, we will know Him more and more and more. And so our joy will grow and grow in Christ, in heaven, in eternity, and in the present. Jesus is our joy, not because we uh, the stock goes up that we are happy or it goes down, we're sad, or we have a good job that we're happy. If we have a difficult job, we're sad. Our joy is not relying on that, but our joy is on in Jesus Christ. For Jesus Christ is our joy. Is that correct? In Philippians 4.4, 4, the Apostle Paul says, Rejoice in the Lord. Where? Rejoice in the Lord always. For the Lord is our joy. Some people, their children is their joy. Their children are their purpose for living. They live according to in their children. But you know what? Our joy is not based on that. Our joy is based on the Lord Jesus Christ. He is our joy. And so the Apostle Paul said, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say, Rejoice. Paul was in a very difficult situation. He was writing these words in the prison in the midst of two Roman soldiers. Yet he was filled with joy in the Lord because the Lord is our joy. And the way we respond to the trials in our lives, it affects our nature. We have a lot of songs in the hymns. 
I was going to open up to see which songs were written by Franny Crosby. Crosby. But one of the hymns that she wrote it records the story of Jesus Christ. Tell me the story of Jesus. Tell me the story again. And Fanny was a woman who lost her vision when she was, I believe, six years old. Oh, sixty years old. And she lived into her nineties. And she wrote a lot of hymns that a lot of people love. And in her ninety-second birthday, this is what she joyfully said: "If within all the world, and you find someone who is more happy and joyful than me, then please bring that person to meet me. I want to shake that person's hand." A woman, twenty, ninety-two years old, yet she was full of the joy of the Lord in her. And what is it that helped? Fanny Cosby to experience such joy when she faced such things that people think is oh unlucky in life that you lost your vision in life. When she, when she was little, since she was little, she chose to rejoice in the Lord always, as in Philippians four four. And in reality, she accomplished her decision that she had. Decided at eight years old, she said, "I have received so many blessings, and so many more blessings than other people have received. I cry because I am blind. No, I cannot do so, and I will not do so." That was what she decided, and so for her whole life, she rejoiced in the Lord. She praised the Lord. She wrote hymns to praise the Lord, and we can rejoice in difficulties. Then. That reveals that there is the presence of the Lord in our lives. If we rejoice in trials and tribulations, that reveals that the presence of the Lord is in us. To rejoice in circumstances that are not um, that are difficult is a motivational force to attract other people to come to the Lord. When people in this life face difficult times, they are sad and grieving. But we, in the same situation, are at peace and rejoice. Then they know that we have the Lord in our lives. So we see that our we don't place our joy in the outside circumstances, but we place our joy in the Lord Jesus Christ, who dwells in our lives. The Apostle Paul and Silas were beaten and imprisoned in the in the dungeon. But they rejoice in the Lord. In the middle of the night, there was an earthquake, and the guard came and saw that the prisoners had escaped. But Apostle Paul said, "Do not be afraid. Do not kill yourself, for we are still here." And the guard said, "What must I do to be saved?" And the Apostle Paul said, "Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and you and your household will be saved." Paul had the joy of the Lord. Though he was in the dungeon, though he was beaten and in pain, yet the joy of the Lord covered him because it was deep in his life, in his heart, for the Lord dwelt in him. When everything is going smoothly and your children are successful and everything's well, then we are happy, right? Yes, God wants us to be happy and be grateful to Him. But that is not the foundation and the basis of our joy. We rejoice in successful. Times as well as times of difficulties. Ecclesiastes seven fourteen says, "In the day of prosperity, be joyful; and the day of adversity, consider. God has made the one as well as the other. We rejoice today, for the day today is the day that the Lord has created. Whether we are prosperous or we are having adversities, this is the day that God has created, and our joy is based on the Lord." Our joy is in heaven. Our treasure is in heaven. Matthew six twenty, and our heart is、uh, focused on in things of heaven. So therefore, our joy that flows from our heart, and if we do not have joy, that is something that is shame that shames God's name. If you have a guest come into your house and see your children, and the children are all sad. Then the parents has nothing to be proud of. 
but whichever household, when you go into the house and the children are happy and they're blessed and they are just happy with one another, talking to one another in gentleness and love and joy, then that person's the guests will say, "Oh, that's a blessed family." And if we live for the Lord, and we have no joy, we have to examine: Are we truly in the Lord, and is the Lord? Presence in our lives. For if we have the Lord Jesus in our life, then we will have joy, and He will rejoice in us. And next, we see that Jesus Christ has compassion. Compassion or mercy is something in emotion that comes from true love. That is something that we feel for the other person, for the state of the other person. And Jesus cried. He was sad when he saw others weeping. He had compassion. In John eleven thirty three and thirty five, when Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled. Jesus wept. That verse, Jesus wept, is the shortest verse in the Bible. In English, only two words. Jesus wept. Yes, Jesus has emotions, and in another place, in Mark one, verse forty and forty-one records, and a leper came to him, moved with pity. He stretched out his hand and touched him, and said to him, "I will be clean." So Jesus moved with pity. He stretched out his hand and touched him, and said to him, "I will be clean." Jesus saw the state, and the com- he had compassion for the person, the leper, and had pity and healed him. So Jesus was a man; he had emotions, but he is also God. He, because he is God, he has compassion. Psalm one o three, verse thirteen: As a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion. To those who fear Him, God the Father looks down at our situation, living in sin, living in difficulties, living in very、uh, great adversities, and He has compassion on us. Do you feel that? Do you sense that? That God is compassionate to us. He unites with us in our joy, and He feels what we feel. He has compassion for us. He sympathizes with us. He rejoices with the joyful and. Cries with those who weep. In Romans twelve fifteen, teaches us very clearly. Let us look, read it together. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. And in First Peter three eight, finally, all of you have unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart, and a humble mind. Someone has shared. Happily, that blessing is an emotion. Or joy or happiness is something that is is easy to.、Uh, I missed it. Happiness is an emotion. It's very easy when you look, when you think about the difficulties of others. No, we don't agree to that. But truly, we see that we have to examine ourselves, right? We want to be successful as our neighbor. There's nothing wrong with it, but our attitude. If I don't have that, then I don't want anybody else to have that. That is a wrong attitude. Someone has shared this. He said, "When I was 13 years old, I started to realize that my younger brother, 10 years old, he was more athletic than I am. He had." Athletic talent more than me, and so I had an unpeace about it. But I did not, I did not allow that to be a jealousy in me. Why is that? Because I love my brother. I live being proud of my brother's athletic abilities. And I shared in his victories as well as his. I share it with him in his,、um, his failures. And he said that I learned a lesson of love. 
And he shared that whenever there was jealousy that comes into me, and it showed forth his ugly tail in him, then he remembered how love had helped him to be victorious over jealousy of his brother. And he remembered the word of God teaching him in 1 Peter 3 8, that is, to have brotherly love. And so he was able to. Re Uh, rejoice with those who are joyful and grieve with those who are sad. Are you happy when your friends are successful? And are you happy when your friends are better than you? Uh, in the past, we have uh, Dr. Tuong in Atlanta. And this friend, he had uh, co uh, he had friends in his class and saw that his friends would uh, be awarded for different things and he would be so happy about his his friend being successful that is to have sympathy or to have compassion to feel for what our friends feel happy when they're happy sad when they're sad are you sad when other people are ha having difficult times or are you happy So, uh, when you see that people are not succeeding and you're happy, no. We are children of God. We cannot be that way. We have a new compassion to be happy with those who are happy and sad with those who are sad. To have brotherly love, to have sympathy, to have compassion for them and to love them truly. And then we see that Jesus was sorrowful. This is the verse, John 11:35. Jesus wept. He wept because of his friend Lazarus who died, and he wept with those who wept. Dave Brandon shared about his friend. He said, My friend has a A daughter had a daughter who died in a car accident in 2005, and she said to me, I'm so easy to cry before my daughter had the accident, and now my, my, my crying just comes at any time. For no reason, my tears will come down. And whoever has experienced such a loss will understand what this woman was saying. To cry, is there anything wrong with it? We have the evidence in the Bible that weeping is natural. There was one time this person um, faced a difficult time and she cried out. And then we just say, oh, keep on crying, keep on crying. You know, sometimes when our friends are When the sisters are crying, we say, don't cry anymore, don't cry anymore. No, just let them cry. Jesus cried. Sometimes people say, when we have a funeral, we should be rejoicing and be happy. No. Jesus cried. Jesus wept. Yes, we are sad. We are happy because our loved one went to be with the Lord. But then we are also sad because death had taken away our loved ones. Yes, we do cry. Cry. Jesus answered, give us the answer. Jesus, Lazarus, his friend died. And when his, their friends came to, to comfort Mar Mary and Martha, and Jesus came and saw Mary and Martha crying and those weepers, Jesus was also touched, and Jesus cried. To be sad, to cry, is something that is very familiar to people on this earth, as well as Jesus. His, <coughs> his tears are very natural. And we see that the reason why the tears come down, and in heaven, we know that there will be no more tears, for Jesus will wipe away all tears. There will be no longer any tears. Here, we do still have tears, but in heaven, there will be no more tears. When he has resolved sin, Jesus Christ will also resolve 
all tears. And so we await the day that we will enter into His kingdom. Jesus is a man. He is sad. But as God, He also is sad. In Genesis 6, 6, says, And the Lord regretted that He made man on the earth, and it grieved Him to His heart. For mankind had far away from Him, and God was sad and grieving because mankind had sinned. But the amazing thing about it, about us, is that as people who follow Christ, we see this as sorrow, but always rejoicing. One who is mature in Christ, they are always rejoicing, but sometimes sorrowful. Sorrowful because we have sinned. Sin grieves the Lord and it shames His name. God grieves when people sin, and sin causes um, pain upon others and shames us. And so we are sorrowful. And you know, if you sin, if you are not sad about it and repent about it, then we have to examine do we belong to Christ? And if you repent and do not, are not sorrowful, then you have to see if you truly have repented. Not that you just say, forgive me, Lord, and then continue in your sin. And do not see that your sin, that your sin um, grieves the Lord and has shamed His name. We must be sorrowful when we sin against God. Sorrowful here is a pain, deep pain, because you have hurt God. Just as Peter had gone aside and cried out loud when he, re when he denied Jesus and the rooster crowed, and Jesus saw him, and he was deeply sorrowful. When we sin against God, we need to be sorrowful and repent. Or are you so callous to sin that you do not see that sin hurts God and grieves Him. In James 4 9 says, Be wretched and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning, mourning and your joy to gloom. We must be sad about our sins. There's a newspaper article that records about a woman for 18 years. She never wept a tear, not because she does not is not sad because she has no emotions, but because <coughs> because a virus has attacked her tear duct, and so she no longer had any tears in her eyes. And the doctor let her know that she has a very um, unusual illness. For some reason, the virus attacked her tear ducts. Or her anti, um, or antibodies attacked it. And so this talks about people, God's people. We should be mourning. We need to study what the Lord Jesus teaches. Blessed are those who mourn. Only those who mourn day and night can I'm sorry, only those who mourn all night can rejoice in the day. When you are sad and grieving about your, your sin and repent, then you will have the joy of the Lord in you. If not, then you will not be able to praise the Lord. You will come into this church, the worship team will be up here singing, and you will be folding your hands in front of you and just standing there. But if you mourn about your sins and you come to the Lord and ask God to cleanse you all your sins, then the joy of the Lord will fill in you and flow out of you, and you will sing out loud and praise the Lord. And you will raise your hands up, high up, and praise the Lord to praise Him, be grateful to Him, exalt Him, His love, His kindness, to praise Him. And you know, we don't just mourn about our sins, sinful nature, but we also mourn about the evil that is around us. The author of Psalms 119, 136 says, My eyes shed streams of tears. Why? Because people do not keep your law. When we see the state of the terrorists, of those who kill other people, 
Do you shed tears? Do you shed streams of tears and pray for them? Not just for the victims that we pray for them, but we also pray for those terrorists and those killers and murderers so that they will come to know the Lord Jesus Christ and experience His love and to receive His grace so that they will no longer have such actions, violent actions. We need to pray. The mature Christian are those who cry because of evil and how evil affects around us. And if we are cold to the evil around us, that is in itself great evil, and we must pray. We must weep and are grieving because of the eternal destiny of the people around us, especially our loved ones. To be sad about sin, the mature Christian, to have the deepest emotion is to grieve about the spiritual states of the people around us, for they are going to eternal condemnation. Do you love them? For if they're there, they will be separated from God forever. They will be separated from the light, from the truth, from the love of God. They will live in deceitfulness, in evil, in wickedness, in anger, in in mm, killing one another, in hurting one another. They will continue to live in that, and the fire of hell is reserved for the devil and those who follow him. And that is the end of uh, the people, our loved ones, if they do not know the Lord. And that is the end of our friends if they do not know him. Do we grieve? Do we grieve because of their state and their eternal destiny? We see that Jesus Christ, when he carried the cross onto Golgotha, we see once again Jesus cried. Jesus cried for the city of Jerusalem. And he mourned about their state. The Apostle Paul was mourning and grieving because of the state of the Israelites, the Jews. And so, therefore, he was willing to sacrifice himself. To sacrifice his rescue, his salvation. He said, Lord, if you, if you take my name off of the book of life so that my people will be entered into the book of life. I am willing, Lord. That is the spirit of sacrifice that the Apostle Paul said, had. And in Romans 9, 1 to 4, in verse 2, I have great sorrow. He who had great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart because of his people. He went and proclaimed the word of God to many people, but his people his own people did not come to the Lord. And so he said, I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. He was one who rejoiced in the Lord always, but he also had a sorrowful heart, an unceasing anguish. So we have those two emotions, though they are contrary, contrast to one another. We rejoice in the Lord, but we are also sorrowful because of the state of eternal separation and death of those who do not know the Lord. Jesus wept. Jesus was glad because Lazarus died. But when he came there, he wept. He was sad. He was sad because of the sins. Because of sin, there is death. And so Jesus was sad, and he wept with those who wept. Are you sad and grieving because of the people who will forever die in eternal hell and pray for them? A.B. Simpson, who established the Christian Missionary Alliance denomination, he came to the Lord and prayed, and he placed his finger on the globe. It actually was right on Vietnam, and he prayed and wept over it for the people of Vietnam. And do you love the Vietnamese people as A.B. Simpson did? Do you hug the globe and point your finger at Vietnam and pray for Vietnam? Jesus gr grieved, and we too must grieve when we see the state of the Vietnamese people and the people in all this world who are dying. 
In John 11:33, when Jesus saw Mary weeping and the Jews who had come with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in his spirit. His he was deeply moved in his spirit and tro greatly troubled. John 11:38. Then Jesus deeply moved again, came to the tomb. In his original word, the word. Troubled in these two words, deeply moved, deeply troubled, talks about a very strong emotion that also leads to anger. Jesus was angry, angry of sin, angry of death, angry of the sadness that sin brings about. And Jesus was, Jesus is a man, and he is also angry, as God is angry in Psalm seven eleven. God is a righteous judge and a God who feels indignation or anger. Every day, he feels anger against sin. In Isaiah forty eight nine, for my name's sake, I defer my anger. For the sake of my praise, I restrain it for you, that I may not cut you off. Praise the Lord that He has restrained His anger. If not, none of us can sit here this morning. For in your la the last week, you have sinned against God, and if God is angry, we would not be sitting here today. But praise the Lord because He restrains His anger and defers His anger. He will not destroy the earth right away, but He wants people to be saved, and that is why Jesus Christ has not come again. For if He comes, His anger will be poured upon about upon the wicked, and we who are saved, God has taken all the condemnation, the anger of God. Jesus has taken it all, but the the anger of God and His condemnation will be upon people who are not saved. But He has restrained His anger so that people will have the opportunities to repent. We are children of God. We also be, know how to be angry. It's not that people children of God do not know how to be angry. In Acts seventeen sixteen, now while Paul was waiting for them at Athens. His spirit was provoked within him. He became angry. His spirit was provoked within him as he saw that the city was full of idols. One time, when I went to the bank, Bank of America, I drove my car out, and it said, "And there's a sign that says Palm Reading in America. There's Palm Reading. Yes, we become angry, provoked." Angry within, when we see people are going and worshiping idols rather than their one true God, Paul became angry because the city was full of idols. And you know, maybe he's still angry today because the idols that we see in the world today are different from the idols in Paul's time. And the idols today are what? Possessions, material things, fame, sports. <coughs> Or and this is all over the place, and it also entered into our house. And we need to cast away all these idols out of our house, out of our mind, out of our spirits, out of our souls. And we must be angry when these things enter into our lives, and we need to repent. Our enemy is Satan, and he is skillfully bringing those idols into our house, into our families. But we must protect and guard our hearts, and we must be angry, become angry before those idols. We do not be become angry at the people who has not come to the Lord. Why? Because the devil has blinded their eyes. We need to love them. Don't be angry at them. Like when we are walking in the、uh, streets and we run into a blind person, they do not see, and we run into them. Are we angry at them? No, we love them because they do not see. So we do not become angry at people in this world who has not come to know the Lord, but we become angry at sin and angry at Satan and angry at this world and be angry at the idols of this world. But we, who are followers of Christ, we have the emotions of anger. We know how to be angry. If we do not become angry, we're not a person. We're not a man. In Ephesians four twenty six, 
That is, when you are angry, be angry. When you are angry, do not sin, right? Do not let the sun go down on your anger. We become angry, yes, but do not sin in our anger. Someone has acknowledged this. Everybody can become angry. That's easy. But to be angry at the right person, at the right time, at the right purpose, in the right way, that is difficult. Do you agree? The Bible lets us see that anger has its place in a Christian's life. Actually, if we lack anger, it could be a sign of spiritual weakness. To be angry because of jealousy or because you are just hopeless, that is sin. But a holy anger to stand against unrighteousness, to stand against evil, to see that God's will will be accomplished, that is a healthy anger. And it is a righteous anger. We must be angry as Jesus was angry. And there are two more emotions. But today, we're out of time. And if the Lord willing, next week we will study those two remaining emotions. We are children of God. <coughs> so we must have emotions as God has. We rejoice when we see that the power of God is revealed and righteousness and truth is revealed. When people acknowledge that Jesus is God and place their trust in Him, the angels rejoice when a lost soul comes to know Christ. And we too will rejoice, right? We rejoice, yes. We rejoice with Miss Hoa when she came to know the Lord. Yes, and she herself rejoices. Praise the Lord. And we also rejoice when we grieve the Lord, when we have shamed Him, when we see the result and the consequence of sin in the world, when we are sad of the destiny of those who do not know the Lord, and we sympathize with the joy and the grieving of others, and we sympathize with them, and we become angry, angry at unrighteousness, angry at wickedness, angry at untruth, angry at hatred. We have the holy anger of God. We must be angry. But we need to bring that force of anger to accomplish God's will, not to hate other people, but to love them and to be more diligent in praying for the lost souls, to be more, um, put more effort to bring the word of God to others. Let us come to the Lord in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for creating us in your image and that we reveal you, Lord. We have emotions. And Holy Spirit, be with us and reign over our emotions so that we have emotions like our Lord Jesus Christ, the one who is living and dwelling in our lives. We thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.